bed. Love. Bed. Bed. Love. <laughs> beyond. Bed, love, beyond. Bed, love, beyond. <laughs> Welcome to Bed, Love, Beyond, the podcast for the hopeful and the hater in us to discuss sex, love, relationship, and whatever's clever with like-minded people like you who are also in limbo with love like us. I am Jen, and Miss April Speaks is out today, but we have music journalist Kathy Ayandali is back in the building. Hi. And she is here for episode 143, Kool-Aid was a popular drink, and it still is. I hope you guys know where that lyric came from. It's a a combination of things, rather. Yeah, it is. I mean... It's Gangstar meets (coughs) Jonestown. (laughs) Oh, damn. (laughs) So we don't really have a daily dish today, but I should tell you guys that we decided to go bi-weekly. Um, as far as releasing the podcast, we forgot to tell you, our bad. So that's why there was no episode last week. The plague did not come get me again. Um, we're going to go bi-weekly from now on and uh, make sure we bring you the newest and most fun topics. Whatever they should be. Miss April, unfortunately, is not with us today, but I think she has some commentary here. And I'm sure next time she's here, she will uh, add some things. So the the topic today, Kool-Aid was a popular drink and it still is. <clears throat> is a little uh, take on uh, my favorite, What is that? I don't know what the right word for that is. Um, it's like my favorite catchphrase, like don't drink the Kool-Aid. Yeah. I don't know why when people say that, I get so excited. I've probably mentioned it before on the podcast, <laughs> but like... You do love a good cult. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do. But it's kind of like when people say shit show, I'm like, hee hee I think it's like great. But when people say don't drink the Kool-Aid, I'm like, oh my God, that's so awesome. Um... Because, uh, what was it, in the 70s? I believe so, yeah. The um, Jonestown Massacre. Um, Jim Jones, yeah. not the rapper. Not the rapper, not Dipset. <laughs> decided to, uh, <clears throat> he was preaching in a congregation and he told all these people that, you know, he would help them and save them and God would help them and come with me to Guyana and uh, we're going to build a life there where everyone can be as one. And at first it seemed like a really good idea. He was kind of like, we're going to be together, black people, white people, Spanish people. We're all going to be one community. We're not going to listen to all this like bias stuff that's going on in the world. It sounded like a really good idea. I might have gone. <laughs> but I might have booked a plane ticket. Uh. It, like he brought them to Guyana and there was a whole little community there and they all became one. And then slowly but surely he started to like separate mothers from children and mothers from husbands and things of that nature. And then. When the heat was getting too hot because I think somebody had left or something of that nature. Yeah, word got out. Word got out that like, eh, it's a little little creepy getting down here. He was kind of just like sleeping with everyone and planting the seed of God, as he so kindly put it, into women. Um, and uh, word got out and then he was like, fuck this, we can't take the heat. You know what we have to do, guys? Hmm. We have to drink this big batch of Kool-Aid mixed with cyanide and they were like yes this is a great idea but the ones who didn't he had people waiting with guns right to shoot him down a lot of people left a lot of people died some people got out um i watched a documentary recently on this and his sons Mm -hmm. um basically said that for whatever reason there was like an away basketball game that day oof and they they were sent out of the cop the the commune or whatever yeah and he's like and then somebody was like i don't remember there being a basketball team yeah it was the jonestown <laughs> basketball team what is this i didn't so i didn't the, know they were in the division so they were sent out um Unreal. and it's really crazy though because like his one son who i think he might have had before the culty stuff began mm-hmm. is very much like i know the things that my father did were horrible but he's my father and i love him and some of the things that he were preaching were mm were powerful and meaningful like Listen. and then like his other brother who's biracial because obviously he was like sleeping with women um in the commune he's kind of like yeah you know <laughs> we don't share the same thoughts per se but you know he still is very much like that is my father so we're talking about that today not to get off topic as i just did um because everyone who watched surviving r kelly this weekend on or last weekend on lifetime um it's kind of been like the talk of the week and no one can stop talking about it. And I felt like it was important because not just because, you know, it's the new buzz topic, but because like I feel like it happens all too often in like common relationships and in general. And I feel like right now, like 
people are kind of divided on where they want to sit mm -hmm. and they're kind of like oh this might be a good idea or you know this sounds like you know it couldn't have really happened or whatever and these women are making it up and people come with a bunch of excuses and i figure we should just like dive a little bit deeper into it um and talk about it and kathy is the perfect person to have here today because kathy is in the industry and i know you know firsthand like some of the shady shit that goes down yeah. um april who was like oh i heard laura styles mention kathy on the radio something about a tweet that you wrote um that you almost got sued for asking Sierra? No, yeah. Was it Sierra? Yeah, it was Sierra. Um, about her, her working with R. Kelly. Mm -hmm. Can you go into that? Or? Yeah, sure. Um, first of all, shout out to Laura Styles. I didn't even know that was on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> I got to tell her. I got to text her. Like, thanks. Um, yeah, it was, it was around 2004, roughly. Um, I believe that was around the time that it was... Um, in anticipation of Sierra's debut album and I was interviewing her and you know <clears throat> you know they send you the album advance and all that other stuff and the thing that struck me as odd I mean this is the thing when it came to R. Kelly from Jump right after 2002 as soon as we learned I mean even before that with the whole Aaliyah situation um was Aaliyah 2002 or four? She had passed away in um, 2001, April mm -hmm. 25th. I mean, August 25th. So when did the marriage take place? Alleged. The marriage took place. I don't want to say alleged because we saw papers. Well, Aaliyah was, um, <clears throat> she was 22 years old when she passed away. So it was seven years prior to that. So 1994 okay. when, um, when Aaliyah first came out. Okay. So, yeah. So we're talking like three years after the whole um, Aaliyah passing. Okay. You know rest in peace but this was this was year a few years after the r kelly incident with the with the child pornography of him urinating on a okay, minor right. and all that other stuff so this is a few years after that mm -hmm. so you know as a journalist i mean i had been writing around i had started writing around the same time i'm looking for the name of this song again because i forgot what it was i um i had started writing around the same time as this r kelly controversy and like my radar stayed up i mean mainly because it was just disgusting but also because of just wow you know mm -hmm. so <clears throat> i'm interviewing sierra and you know she was lovely she was she's young you know she was mm. um she was pretty much you know still a kid at least you know i mean people will argue that 18 or 17 is not like a child but right. you know in speaking to her she was pretty young like young-minded too mm -hmm. so we're having this conversation um and I went ahead and, um, you know, I'd asked her just like casually because, you know, after I was like skimming this project, there was this song that was on there that was written by R. Kelly. And I'll get the name of it because now I forgot and I and I wrote about it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I put it up on Twitter and um, give me a moment. I should have come prepared for this. I didn't, no, it's OK. I, no, actually, it, I kind of want to preface because I feel like maybe some people who are in the UK or yes. in other countries may not know what Surviving R. Kelly is, but it was a docuseries that was put out, a six hour docuseries about all the people who are survivors who have been in some kind of relationship or I don't even want to use the word relationship or domestic partnership had fallen under the prey of r kelly right yeah and they are coming out now telling their story mm -hmm. um they also had like different psychologists and different people from the industry well john legend um kind of giving their two cents and uh r kelly was really upset about it you know he was threatening to sue he put up a website for an hour um and it brought a lot of attention to it because i know for me personally i remember hearing that he married r Ke uh, Aaliyah. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, that's weird. But like to me, he was still young and I didn't get the age difference. Yeah. And I remember hearing about him urinating on the girl video, but I never really saw it. And if I did see it, I saw like a really blurry bootleg of it. Mm -hmm. And it's not that I didn't believe it. It's mm -hmm. just that. I guess to sound fucked up, like it didn't matter to my world at that age. Sure. Well, I mean, I got the name of the song. now. Okay. So he. He was, jeez, oh, okay. So the name of the song is um, Next to You. And he wrote the song, and I want to read you the lyrics, mm -hmm. okay? Um, I hope I don't make you mad. This is Sierra. I hope I don't make you mad with what I'm about to say, boy. 
um, here we are once again. I'm having second thoughts, boy. I'm not messing with your head, but I changed my mind, boy. I don't know why I'm here the same I want you near. If you want me to leave, I'll understand. See, I'll just have to respect your wishes, boy, because if I stay, you know, tell him what may happen, boy. Although you look so good to me, it's best that I leave. And then the two of them sing the hook. I'm scared of being next to you because of what I think I might do. Boy, you're turning me on right now. I can't get down like that right now. I don't want to disturb the flow, but this is not my MO. Hold up, wait a minute. We're moving too fast. I want something like this here to last. And R. Kelly comes through and says, don't say no, baby, not right now baby I want you to be my lady you got me going crazy now he was 35 years old when um actually no he was 37 years old if he was born in 1967 let's say for argument's sake this was 2004 mm -hmm. he was 37 years old right you know and people came at me for this I asked her myself mm -hmm. I said when how old were you when this song came out mm -hmm. when he wrote this song and I have to <laughs> she said to me I think was like 14 15 when we got in the studio that's what she said to me and mm. i don't think she understood just the like i don't think the she, dynamic it, of yeah, your she question didn't understand the dynamic between that relationship too right so you know people argue this but this is from from what i know you know as far as the industry history of this you know sierra had um had been writing since she was like 15 years old mm -hmm. and working with jazzy Faye long before she got her record deal like within two to three years before that record deal mm -hmm. she had cut a ton of songs well not a ton let's say like four or five and then she got her deal. Right. R. Kelly's song was part of those original chunks of songs that ultimately ended up on goodies. Mm -hmm. So if he's in a, he's, he's in the studio or at least writing a song from the perspective of doing a duet, he was a 30, now, okay, let's take that away then. He was a 35-year-old man doing a love song duet with a 15-year-old. Right. So never mind the fact that I'm pretty sure she was 14, but uh, I'm not going to, you know. 14, 15, 14, 15 17, it doesn't right, matter. Right. But whatever. So I put in this article. It was in print. I'm not going to shout out the publication. They still owe me money. Um, <laughs> Damn. Uh, <laughs> Shots fired. <laughs> um, I put out that there's a, a, a questionable song on the right. album featuring a then 14-year-old, 15-year-old Tierra. Mm -hmm. So... I got threatened with a lawsuit mm -hmm. suggesting that I was over exaggerating the nature of the song and the relationship between the two of them, which was not something that I was putting out there in any way, shape or form, at least for Sierra. But right. if you're this disgusting, you know, pedophile, sexual deviant. Right. And someone says to you, I want you to write this song for this girl who's 15 years old. That's what he came up with. Right. And, and that was the point of, it was more of a jab to R. Kelly. Now, granted, this was one of her first interviews and her, one of her first profiles. I shouldn't have like, Probed her, I guess, like that. Not even probed her. I well, just no, asked you just the ask question. question. True. I didn't want to, I shouldn't have given him any shine. Right. But at that point in time, we're talking like, I'm still like two years removed from the peeing video mm -hmm. and I'm still super enraged. And like, even at the time I had just started, I was only writing for a few years. Mm -hmm. I was like, anytime I had the opportunity to shit on this man, ooh. <laughs> to, to, if I had any time I had any opportunity to slam him right. in, in any way, shape or form, I was going to do it even as a newbie. And they threatened to sue me. And they, and I remember, I remember distinctly because I, you know, I was a paralegal. I was still working, um, mm -hmm. you know, working at a law firm, uh, when I had first started writing, they came to me and they were like, we're going to get you for slander. We're going to get you for slander. And I remember replying to them and I said, if you're going to sue me, get me for libel. Because libel is um, mm -hmm. slamming someone in print, in words. And okay. slander is verbally. Like if I go and say blah, 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 that's oh, okay. slander. If I write it down, it's libel. You're like, so they're coming, correct first. Yeah, they're coming at me. I was like, if you're going to sue me, sue me for libel. So basically what we had to do. We had to present the lyrics. Mm -hmm. We had to present the transcript where Sierra openly admits that she was young. Mm -hmm. And then we had to present the news stories that showed that R. Kelly, like there was there was merit in a one sentence of me calling it a questionable song. Right. Here are the lyrics of him luring. He's a grown ass man. You're talking now, let's say 35 years old, luring a 14, 15 year old, whatever, 16 if you want to argue whatever right you're luring this girl and she's talking about how she's not sure and he's like nah nah now's not the time to like there's never a video for that right no <laughs> but for some people they really love that song and the thing is like you think about it now and you're like Ugh. i mean i was um i was interviewed the other day about um r kelly and the question was you know considering that this the height of r kelly and Aaliyah 
was during our youth at a point right. where I mean Aaliyah was our age mm-hmm. you know what I mean and she's she's turning 40 like next week you know that would have been her 40th birthday but the question was how did we not know any better as we were going through this and my argument was when the Backstreet Boys released their debut album Kevin Richardson was 25 years old so you're talking about these boys men these men who are dancing and singing to 13 year olds and these 13 year olds have these posters on their wall of 25 year old men talking about that's going to be my husband one day we are already introduced to this dynamic that this older man is like a sex symbol to us in the most innocent way of what we can consider to be a sex symbol so that was like part of like what i wanted to research because i know like a little bit about it but like i wanted to get more like direct quotes to make sure i was talking about the right shit and there was an excerpt from this article that i put up and it said the frontal lobes of the brain are responsible for insight judgment impulse control empathy and these are things as as teenagers have that yeah i'm sorry these are things that teenagers have a hard time putting together right so they're not able to do those things um and they're saying that like as teenagers we have very active brains Mm -hmm. but we have no brake system wow so we can we could be like, oh, this is good, this is good, this is fun, this is fun. But we don't know how to stop. Right. So, like, everyone, a lot of people were saying, and I know, you know, we kind of got into it with some friends on Facebook, like, about, well, she's 14, she should have known better. She, yeah, she doesn't. She? And April said the same thing in one of her posts that she put up. Like, you don't know better at 14. Like, you don't. any one of us at 14 could have been approached by whoever your favorite person is right now and be like, oh, like, come do this, come do mm-hmm. that. I, I'm going to promise you this wonderful thing. Right. And we were like, oh, this sounds like fun. And, like, I do think there's a slight difference of, I don't even want to say it's, like, how you were raised, but I think, like, I was raised by fear. I was afraid, <laughs> I was afraid of my parents. Right, right. Like, so I would have been like, my mom is going to beat my ass right. if I – don't show up or if I don't do this or if I don't do that or if I came home pregnant or something. Right. So I was afraid of them. Mm-hmm. Um, is, yeah. is it better to be feared or loved? Apparently feared. About, about both. Um, <laughs> but um, but like, I, I mean, I think maybe parenting is different, but like, I don't think that anyone just sit there and say a 14 year old should know better. Not at all. You know, that's not really fair to say. And, you know, there is research showing that at that age, your brain isn't developed to like, understand like where this could go what's gonna happen what can happen after that r kelly wants me to go somewhere with him oh my god and i can sing Mm -hmm. fuck this i'm gonna be like the next Aaliyah. and that's all you care about you don't know about that he married her you don't know that he peed on a little girl you don't know and honestly even if you know you don't care at that point you don't and you know you mentioned jim jones right and not the rapper not the rapper um the thing that we have to keep in mind is when Jim Jones was setting up Jonestown, he went into per- he purposely went into underprivileged neighborhoods mm-hmm. and actually targeted and preyed upon black people and brown people because mm-hmm. he tried to present himself like this like fucking Cortez figure, like this guy who's going to like prey upon people and and posture himself as the savior. And it's just gross because R. Kelly did the same thing. Like let's keep it a hundred. There's a reason why he didn't target white girls. Right. He would have gotten caught a long time ago. Like, young black girls are the least protected people in society. And he knew that. And that's the thing. If you're sitting there and you're... It's it's two different things, right? He's he's luring them with success, right? right. And most of these girls, and I'm not, not all of them, but most of them wanted in some way to be a singer, right? right. They wanted to be in the music industry. He's coming at it from a completely sexual way. And that's the thing that's like also just this like the duality of just how awful it was is because he had this like he had this deep like venom and this evil inside of him to like prey upon these girls, but lure them with the very thing that they thought was going to be their chance to make their lives better and they're better for their families. Now it's just evolved. I mean, the thing is, for as many blind eyes and deaf ears that fell upon this whole situation, this is why he's allowed to have a sex cult now. This was right. this was um, a snowflake that turned into a giant snowball. Like this is the pebble that turned into the boulder because everyone ignored this for so long, and because he's such a disgusting sociopath. He built this. It just got worse and worse and worse because and you can attest to this from, you know, from your um, your background, uh, professional background. 
sociopaths get bored. Oh yeah, with <clears throat> with their tactics, and you know it's kind of like um you know and a lot of people are watching finally watching the Netflix series now. You yeah right. You know I mean we were about it when it was on Lifetime, but <laughs> you know um, but even that character he started at it's it 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 um it intensifies. It starts at you know purposely like setting up traps right then you get bored with the setting up traps then you hold the person the person hostage then you get bored with holding them hostage then you got to kill them it becomes it just keeps getting worse and worse and for r kelly that's exactly what happened it's, right it'd be like um oh you sing can you come to chicago right oh you can and that's one thing they did say in the documentary which which is very in nature of any sociopath or, you know, anybody who's, like, preying upon anyone, they know what questions to ask. Because mm-hmm. if you would have come to me at the mall, and I'm not saying I'm better than any of these women. Right. Because, trust me, some of them, I would have been, like, I don't know. I, I love Genuine when I was little. I would have been like, oh, uh, yeah, I can go. But um, I couldn't have. I wouldn't be able to because I'm just not allowed. Right. But, like, if somebody were like, oh, can you do this? Can you do that? I'd be like, yeah. Oh, we're having an after party at the, um, at the hotel tonight. Can you make it? I'd be like, oh, Kath, let's go tell our moms we're going to Willowbrook. Instead, let's just go to this after party. Right. You know, like we've been like, yeah, this is a great idea. And at first it was that he would ask questions and set them up. Mm -hmm. And then like once he got them to their house, it would be like, oh, you should come over to my house and you should wear a bathing suit. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're in my house in a bathing suit. Walk for me. Oh, you look good. You're really pretty. And all of a sudden this person who every 14 year old girl has low self-esteem. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. At 14, you all do. But this person who is in high power, who's good looking, who could get you things, who's like whatever is enamored with you. Right. In this moment, and you're like, "Oh, this is great." He's like, mm, "Take the bathing suit off." Yep. You know what? Call me daddy. Mm-hmm. What the fuck? Like it just keeps escalating and escalating, and these women want to please him, and they want to, they want the the positive attention that's coming back to them. Right. So it seems like such a good idea, and then it starts to get out of control. It's like, uh, you looked at that guy when he was walking down the hallway. Right. You're sitting in that room for the rest of the day and you're shitting in the bucket. Right. Right. You're not eating for three days. And one girl said it that escalates. was her breaking point. I know. I, that, I was that, like, <clears> I was like, mm, that was her breaking point. Cause as soon as he punched me, slapped me in the face, I would have been like, Oh no, she said she was like five something and he's like six something. Right. And he yoked her up, like I guess from the neck right. and brought her eye level to him mm-hmm. and she blacked out and she passed out. You know, and I'm what I'm I'm, what I'm I have right here is R. Kelly's memoir Solar Coaster. Oh, that's right. You did say you read Solar Coaster. Unfortunately, I was part of this book club um, years back where we um, we were purposely reading like terrible books. <laughs> so it was, I think it was actually called the Terrible Book Club. I forget. So we read Solar Coaster. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I didn't pay any money to get this back. Like at the time, it was uh, I actually regret buying it then because it's after all of this situation. I regret giving him that money, but actually, I might have bootlegged it. It's on my iPhone, mm-hmm. so it might have been a rip. So uh, I don't explain what it is though first. So Solar Coaster. I've, I've, before you mentioned it, I honestly I've heard of a lot of like biographies and all biographies. Mm-hmm. I've never heard of his. Yeah, Solar Coaster is you know basically just R. Kelly's memoir. Um, I mean, it obviously has to be ghostwritten because, you know, he's admitted many times over that he can't Ooh. read, using that as, like, some sort of ploy to get someone in bed, which I think is just... <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I can't read. I can't rape anybody. Yeah, it's what? like, what? We're not um, real. Yeah. Like, <laughs> so there's... um The part that always troubled me, and I just found it. I was looking for it. Um, was he was discussing his, like, first sexual experience. And I'm not going to, like, go into the detail because I don't know how many people might get triggered by something like this. But he was a child, and the girl was an adult. And... um in a nutshell in the book a lot of these people are having sex in his house like his house had just a lot of people just like i don't know i tried to look up the word prostitute and then like it didn't show up in the book and he was trying to say like i was like you know when he later tries to excuse his behavior he said i was like molested by a prostitute or something like that so as a kid he goes and he takes um he sees two people having sex and he takes a polaroid of it Mm -hmm. and he shows it to them like i took this right Mm -hmm. of you two having sex and he was like, oh, he says in the book, I was like more impressed by the technology of the photo than the actual sex happening. Were you? Because when <laughs> he tells the girl, she he details this very erotic scene. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm going to hand it to you. Don't read it out loud. I, but I just want your reaction of this paragraph. OK. OK. The, um, the bottom paragraph. The, if you can read to the part, read from three's company down. 
Um, so while you're reading it, I'll, I'll just talk. Okay. So he's painting this picture of kind of this erotic scene. And it's to the point where you you don't really understand in that moment. Like you kind of forget that it's a child with an adult because he paints it in this very like just sexual way and he's not painting it in this way that would suggest that he's being molested when he is in fact being molested right. let's not take away from that but the problem is you're dealing with a man who is so programmed if you swipe it you could see the next I, yeah, okay I am. you can you're talking about a man who as a child and even as a grown man is programmed to believe that when an adult was having sex with him, they were quote unquote making love. And I think that's the that's the the thing that has lived in his head for now. Damn man. Yeah, for now like <clears throat> like five decades. So you're talking So about- basically what what I read, I and like Kathy said, like one, not to promote his book, and two, not to trigger anybody. Basically it just says that like she kind of gave him moral and you know, wouldn't stop and he was afraid of her. And she said that if you say anything, you're going to get a whooping. Mm-hmm. So he was afraid and he said that he kind of kept it to private to himself the his whole life, I guess. Right. But um, the other part that, um, you know, in later chapters, like they they actually developed, uh, I think, after some like, kind of relationship. Yeah. Like, I don't want to really keep reading it, but it's, right. it's kind of um, the way he describes it, though. So they always say hurt people hurt people. And it's true. Yeah. Not an excuse. No, no. I mean, I, I think uh, me and April were talking about how Chris Brown, what we talked about before on the podcast, how Chris Brown's mom was abused, and that's why he thinks it's okay that he hits people. But I think April said something. Well, Chris, Chris Brown, Brown also talked about losing his virginity at eight years old, and he mm. says, like, I made love to a woman at eight. It's like, you didn't. Right. You know, you're, but that's the other problem, too, is that, you know, they always say, you know, protect young black girls, but also protect young black boys, because these young guys these little kids think that they had sex like and that that's the thing and if if they you know there's not enough protection around those children to make them not grow up and think that that's like an acceptable mark in their past i mean it's just gross but the but at the same time r kelly has enough money and enough resources to have put in the work to kind of reprogram himself and and erase some of those things but you know we were talking about this the other day when Tori is getting interviewed interviewing r kelly and he was like you know do you have sex with teenage girls and he's like when you say teenager how old and like Tori was like i didn't think they were gonna let me go and he's like and then r kelly just has this look in his eyes like yes yes keep going and it's like (laughs) it's like he's literally turned on by children and there's Everyday people, when they have that, right, <laughs> they go to jail and they and then they go or they get like intensive therapy. This that's disgusting. But because he's famous, because he has money, because people think he's beloved for his music. What I also found funny was that whenever anyone is talking about R. Kelly, the only like reference to songs, I believe I can fly in the remix to Ignition. And it's like so funny because I'm just like, there was no original to Ignition. There really was no original to Ignition. <laughs> He's got some talent remixing nothing. So but- I saw the meme that said I knew R. Kelly was crazy when he remixed uh, a song and he was the only one on it. I was like, God damn. Right. <laughs> But those are the only songs they ever play when they're thinking about him. And they're talking about, like, how this man is some, like... Well, they talked about on the documentary, which I did find a lot of validity in, is that every time things were getting hot, like, R. Kelly would go sing, I believe I could fly at a church or something. And some choir would be singing it. And everyone would keep continuously putting this man on a platform and a pedestal because, Mm -hmm. you know... He was the greatest entertainer of our time because Michael Jackson's dead now and then people have their opinion about him, which is a whole other podcast. Yeah. But, um, you know, people just say, OK, like, you know, he did a horrible thing and then he came and performed at Whitney's funeral. They're like, he looked nervous. I'm like, did he look nervous? Did I don't he? know. We weren't looking at him. We were, right. we're, we're mourning Whitney. Right. So, like, I, I wasn't paying attention to him and he just kind of kept coming out like it wasn't a problem. My thing was like watching it. I watched it with my neighbor and my boyfriend and like my boyfriend kind of like some women. He was just like, this is crazy. This is crazy. Where's the fathers? Where this, where's the fathers? And then once we got to the later episodes where there were fathers, he was like, you ain't no man. That's not your father. Like, I'm just like, oh, my God. <laughs> and 
the biggest question everyone keeps saying is like why did these women stay why did they continually stay and like they talked about the cycle of abuse on the the thing and basically the cycle of abuse can occur in any kind of situation and i'm sure very much it was like occurring in that situation like you kind of walk on eggshells for a while and tension starts to build and you're like, oh my God, he, I don't want him to get mad at me, but you know, whatever. These girls were walking around trying to see each other in the house and they couldn't see each other, maybe sneaking phones. That's the incident. So he's like, oh my God, you were trying to sneak and see somebody and then he'll smack the shit out of her or whatever. And then it's like, Gross. oh my God, this is terrible. And then he'll come up to her maybe the next day and be like, here's here's money go shopping buy a dress you're beautiful i love you i just want to sleep with you tonight Mm. you know and then they're like oh he loves me again everything is wonderful Mm. and things are going to be better this time and there's a calm for a while until Mm. it happens again and it keeps happening it keeps happening and i know like a lot of times in therapy women will come in and be like well things are okay now they're okay now right well wait because this is going to happen again. Like, right. you just have to wait. It, it could take weeks. It could take months. It's going to happen. It could take years. Patterns of behavior don't change. No, exactly. People, like, And that's the thing. If people haven't put in work to actually change, you can't sit there and say, well, you know. And since he's been with some of these girls, while their brain has been developing from 14 to 28 so to 35, true. he's been molding their brain. Th- these women who are with him now are not there uh, against their will. No. No. Their mothers are crying, throwing rocks, looking for them. They are not leaving. The one girl was on TMZ. She's like, I'm fine. I'm good. You know, I think they sent they fine, they I'm sent good. um the Chicago police out to his studio yesterday. Mm-hmm. Nobody was there. And I think they spoke to some of the other girls and everyone's saying everything's great. They're not leaving. It's scary. It's scary because you're right. I never even thought about that. Their brains developed while they were with him. Right. They didn't have any. There's no sense of morality there. No. I read something else that said that, like, people who have sex, well, they said m- mammals, but I'm sure it applies to people as well. It was in a human article. But people who have sex at a younger age mm-hmm. are um, have higher levels of depression and, like, certain things, like, don't form in their brain. Wow. And they notice that they're, they have smaller reproductive tissues compared to those that had intercourse later in life or not at all. So, like, the longer you wait, I guess, like, the more like uh strength you have kind of inner strength um so you think about some of these girls are having like sex sex at 14 like they're already predispositioned for depression and anxiety and all these things and the only thing that's making them feel any ounce of worthwhile is this one man they don't have anything else um and the other thing that they talked about, which I was like all excited, I was like, this was on the test. Uh, learned helplessness is my favorite thing. I don't know why. Learned helplessness? Yeah. <laughs> it's like Stockholm Syndrome. Mm-hmm. Um, basically, the definition is a condition which a person suffers from a sense of powerless arising from a traumatic event or persistent failure to succeed. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is thought to be one of the underlying causes of depression. So it's kind of like when you see an animal at the zoo mm-hmm. and they're not really tied to anything, but they're not running. Mm. Why are they not running? Because right. if they run, they gotten beat before, oh. and they're <laughs> it's an electric fence almost. Yeah, like they're not gonna run. Mm. Like the one girl said that her getting starved was her breaking point. <laughs> I don't know why. I really, I've really pissed me off. I don't know why. I was like, really, but then it would have been my breaking point too. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> fuck this. You're not in giving the, me in food. In the midst of being hangry, you decide to run out. You're like, fuck this. And you know what she had to do to leave? She grabbed her bag and she walked out the door. And that was it. It's crazy. No one stopped her. No one cared. And she said that she got to the airport and she was like very emotional. And she was like, I need to go back. And I'm going to I'm going to call him and call him. And she kept calling him and calling him. And she's like, if he answers, I'll go back. Oh and he God. didn't answer. And that's the only reason she didn't go back. Wow. And the fucked up part about her was that like, you don't know what kind of damage had happened in her life prior to that. Mm-hmm. But she was like a successful radio DJ prior to meeting him. She met him on a radio show that she was doing. And how old is she? 35. She was 35 years old. Oh, that's why he didn't care if she came or left. Yeah, well. Like that, I mean, but also the amount of power that he must feel in himself to know that these women are not being like held against their will that adds more fuel to his ego Mm -hmm. and knowing that they're like, Oh, they're staying for me because I'm the king. And it's like, Oh, 
puke. It's just, it's, it's so, it's, ho- it's so like disheartening. And it's like, the other part is, um, I think I'm glad what, um, this lifetime docu-series did for us mm-hmm. was let us know that it's happening still in real time. Right. Because when so many people think about this situation, I mean, even, you know, one of uh, the people that we know on Facebook mm-hmm. putting it up like, why, why are they, why, why now? Well, cause it's still happening. You just don't know about it. Yeah. That, and that's the part that April keeps getting pissed about. Cause people are like, well, what about, what about Weinstein? And what about this person? And what about that person? And it's like, we're not talking about them right yeah, now. We're not talking about them right we're now. We're talking about R. Kelly right now. The, they're going to get their time. Catholic priests, they're going to get their time. Yeah, exactly. People are like, well, Catholic priests have been touching boys. I'm like, it doesn't make it right. It like, doesn't, like, they're wrong too. Yes. You can still be wrong. Everyone can be wrong at the same time. Imagine but that. We're going to talk about this sex cult involving this man that's been urinating on people for now 17 years, uh, probably sooner, uh, earlier, but we just didn't really know about it. Because that, if that sex tape or that, I'm sorry, that child pornography did not leak, right. we probably would have only thought that R. Kelly happened to have been in a relationship with a 15-year-old. And we would have not ever realized what was going down so one of the notes that april had put in here is about um the the court of public opinion mm-hmm. everyone keeps talking about the parents the parents the parents yeah um one of her notes say that what if the humili the humili i'm sorry the humiliation was too much like imagine being a parent and having to like it's almost like you failed right you know a little bit of it's like you know and some of the the dads and the moms are like i, I did fail the one dad who signed over his rights to R. Kelly when she was 18 or like 17. 17, right. Like, he knows he failed. He knows he fucked up. It's not a secret at this point. Like, you know, just because they said they're going to have a female looking after her. Like, he played you. That's so depressing. And she was saying, like, what if they were told they didn't have a case? Mm-hmm. Like, no, you know, like some of them are being told now, like, she's 18, she's 22, she's whatever. We can't help you. And um, she said that all the money is better like uh, oh is the money better than nothing so i guess like in sparkles mm-hmm. niece's case who knows what they offered them right right because he was on top of the world at that point mm-hmm. and as sparkle said that the niece's father is still in the credits as uh playing guitar for him on his albums Ugh, ugh. that was heartbreaking though i felt bad for sparkle and I, I know she knows that she played her part in it and that like i felt bad up until she released a song <laughs> I'm sorry. Like, I mean, I get Lifetime didn't pay these women, but there was there was really no time to debut your little song. Like, I'm, yeah. like, I'm good. And, then you know, I don't know why it was even played on the series, but I didn't realize it was. But I read something that. Yeah. yeah and then it was released like the next day, like formally. And I'm just like, you know, mm-hmm. there's going to be someone not that she doesn't deserve to have a career. Right. But there's going to be someone. She could have waited a month. Right. Like, there's somebody that's going to say that she only did that for the exposure for her album or her song. Someone like everyone. Someone like everyone. (laughs) No, but that's the problem. When you are programmed to even believe that you have to separate the artist from the art. Right. If you're someone who really and truly feels like, well, you know, then you're going to have to... It's whatever makes you, you know, sleep at night. And I think, like... Nobody wants to hear about that stuff. So if this becomes like they're going to look at this like a witch hunt. And then if Sparkle releases the song, they're going to turn around and say, see, she was just doing this as a publicity stunt. He's fine. What I don't like now is that everyone's kind of coming out and saying, well, Drake is the 17 year old. And um, Timberland admitted that when he was in the studios with Aaliyah, that he was in love with her. Right. Like sexually attracted to her. He thought about it. He right. said, God damn, she's pretty. Right. You know what? Anybody with eyes would say she's pretty. She'd be probably be great to have sex with. But you think things and thinking things is not illegal. The action is what makes it illegal. And people still want to kind of like deflect from what we're actually talking about. And that's of like course. the most craziest part. I mean, people were saying like, oh, uh, everyone's got their bird box going for for r kelly now because it just put their blinders right, on to like right but the music and i don't know if it, a lot of people are are separating right the man from the music or just putting it all together like i understand why you have to put it together do we love r kelly's music we did right <laughs> 
but we can't now. I can't listen to any of that stuff anymore. I, after the documentary, I can't. I have to be honest with you. I heard about the cult thing. I never like looked into it or read it. I was just like, oh, that's crazy. Um, and I did. I don't know if someone brought the, the bootleg to my college room or something. But like you couldn't really see anything on the video. Oh, the sex tape? Yeah. Or the porn, the channel, child pornography? It's all over Pornhub now. Which is like gross because this is a child. It's still child pornography. And I right. made the mistake of calling it a sex tape on Facebook. And I have to just keep correcting myself. It's child pornography. Right. And I think like, you know, the fact that that exists on Pornhub means that child porn is sitting on Pornhub, which is like, you know, people right. should be policing that and doing something about that. You know, um, that's but, a good point. But I think like. The one thing that I, I, I can't stress enough to people is if you're like a lot of people, you know, we're in this like society of masochists. Right. Mm-hmm. And we purposely just like consume things to be horrified. Right. Like we're like and we do it on even the most basic level. I know we talk about this. If you don't like someone, um, if you don't really like someone, what do you do? You go on their Instagram. Right. And you sit and stare look at it. Look at what they're doing. Look at what today. they're doing. Look at look at that like grilled cheese. Like, you know, like <laughs> and um we do it and we we consume the things that we hate because we're just like it's a content driven culture, so we're just we're just um overstimulated constantly. So <clears throat> once we've gone through all the things that we actually like, mm-hmm. we start to then consume the things we don't like because we just need content, content, content. They're like, and, oh, this video says like you know how the on Facebook they have like uh, explicit content yes. and it's blurred out. We're like, we we now, must know now what's I behind. Need to know we this. must know what's behind that eye. I mean, when the um when that uh the um. The chimpanzee ripped the woman's face off. Like they're like, no, I, now I gotta see it. Oh, I want to see what her face looks right. like. Right, new so, face or old face, old yeah. faces. So we consume the things that we find gross, and and the problem is now with R. Kelly. What's happening is, people who saw this uh, docu series are horrified. Mm-hmm. So, well, we hope you're horrified. But then what you're going doing is you're going on iTunes and you're listening to his music. You're checking for clues. You're hate listening. Ah, look at this. But what you're doing is you're putting money in his pocket and building his empire still so he can continue to do this behavior. You're going on Facebook and the people who like his page, you're, these likes, this engagement puts money in his pocket. If you are if you don't want to be the person on the platform and stand on your podium, get on your little soapbox and talk about how wrong this is, but you believe it's wrong, then, then that's fine. But right. don't stream that music. Don't put money in his pocket. And the other thing is, and this is a trigger warning for uh, for anyone who's listening. I went on his Facebook page, and there's people on there saying, "R. Kelly, can you rape me?" And the that's the problem. You're oh, there's little girls like, oh, I listen to my album. Yeah. Do and you I'm still sure- date? Do you still date teenagers? And it's like, and I'm not talking about a grown woman trolling. I'm talking about an actual teenager. Right. Being like, oh, I, I hear you're big on this. Is um, right. Will my album get put out now? Because I'm like, and I'm sitting there and I'm just like, how do people think this is acceptable behavior? But it's like, you're looking at moms who are still R. Kelly fans and they're still playing that music. Their daughters are going to sit there and think, well, if mom is listening to this. The only thing I didn't understand was B2K was like, oh, we're going to ban our r kelly oh yeah song Omarion, after, after the concert no why don't you be proactive and do it now why don't you be proactive and not take that money you want to you want to leave the check on the table if you're really passionate about what's going on what is it two songs yeah something like that don't play the fucking two songs exactly big deal because the other thing is you have to remember when something is performed it puts money in his pocket right like all bmi ascap anytime anytime like if you if you go to a cafe if i work at a cafe mm-hmm. and i purposely want to play r kelly's music to shit on r kelly right and i just play the remix to ignition i know i i keep saying remix to ignition like it's the ignition remix <laughs> i'm like saying <laughs> it like it's like the hook right but you play that remix in a cafe just to be able to say can you believe this pig you're giving him more money right, when so you're playing it. Someone's going to download it. Someone's going to Shazam it. Or just by the nature of when you play music in public, in a public setting, mm-hmm. the pu- you, publishers typically come like you. You can't just like, you know, it was Starbucks, like Starbucks, like they play music that's from a Starbucks kind of radio type. Of right. Thing. If you get policed, if somebody from BMI or ASCAP is in that building, they're going to work with like a uh, like Apple Play. Like when you pay one subscription fee, do they get streaming streaming rights every time the song plays? I'm super. Now I heard Spotify cut him from their playlist, 
But then I heard that his Spotify numbers were up, so I was like, how did that happen? Well, the Spotify will cl- – um, so Spotify has two different things. So there's a streaming service where you actively go and look for music, and then there's a playlist oh, where okay. it's like, go check this out. So they remove them from the playlist. It's still kind of like, you know, tricky dicky because they're telling you we're not going to promote him on in our best of R&B. Oh, OK. But if you still want to find him, He's in by him. all means, go look for him. Gotcha. So you're still and that's the thing. His numbers were skyrocketing. And I think like it's still putting money in his pocket. We need to neutralize him. If you don't neutralize this man, he's still going to grow in power. This sex cult is you know this culmination of us ignoring all of this and the more power you give it the more you feed it i'm scared for what the next thing is going to be i think right now like i'm hoping what he's doing is he's losing steam he's already lost a couple properties right apparently the place in chicago is up for sale where he was keeping women because I, I don't know if the numbers are right, but they said he was worth one hundred and fifty million, mm-hmm. and now he's only worth a million. I don't, I don't know think a million that. is right. Well, hopefully, but I mean, yeah, I mean, because that's going to get him through twenty nineteen. I mean, mm-hmm. um, so and that's the thing is like these women are getting money from him, and one shitty perform another, whether it's housing or clothes or whatever the case may be, and if he's not able to do that. You know, maybe that's what they need to wake up and be like, I need to go home <laughs> maybe to my Maybe they're not getting fed and that's the point. <laughs> They'll be like, oh, no. Gross. No spaghetti tonight. I'm going back home to my mom. What's crazy is like the one girl's mom who got her out of her, mm-hmm. she went back three days later. I mean, she eventually came back with her mom, but like that's how brainwashed mm. they are. Like, and I was reading what well, you told me about uh, Taz's Angels. <laughs> yeah. So it's not like just R. Kelly. Like this is uh, this is why I thought it was important to talk about, but mostly in the context of R. Kelly. But like women, I don't know of any men who this is happening to, mm-hmm. but women are like, for whatever reason, feeling the need to like be controlled or be in these environments where you know they're being taken care of or they think they're being taken care of, mm-hmm. but they're also being like prostituted or abused or. Whatever the case may be. Right. So you were like who explain just briefly who Taz's Angels are. So um, Taz's Angels are. They're this group of women who live in this mansion led by this man named Taz. Um, it's in Miami, you said, right? It's in Miami. And, you know, it's just a, it's a collective of these women and they've been kind of. I don't want to say prostituted out because I don't want to. But I think they have. Right. But, you know, people have very um, controversial views on, on, on sex work. Right. You know, some people consider that to be um, a legit job, a, a viable form of business. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like and, and some people don't. So that part of it, I can't really, you know, in, in either direction. If you're if you're someone who promotes sex work. You know, that's, you know, they're, they're, it's looked upon as like no big deal. Mm-hmm. It's the abuse that goes on and it's um, also just their treatment and then how these women kind of interact. And it's this um, this strange sense of community that comes of it. And, um, you know, Taz kind of sends these women out to show up at parties or sleep with um, artists. Yeah, and there's something like Tigger or something. Tiger. One of the, tiger. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> not, Tig- not, not the guy from BT. Oh. Um, so, uh so um yeah so she, like you know there was there's you know these kind these girls that go out there and um you know they get in the, the common thing is they want to get put on in the industry and i think like the thing about taz's angels and r kelly sex cult and all this other stuff is just how celebrity obsessed we are mm-hmm. as a society right and the idea of the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow is now a viral video with like a sponsorship deal or you know, a Fashion Nova clothing uh, sponsorship or a Fit T endorsement ad. It's become it's become such a the way that society is kind of viewed is like you're a complete failure if you're not famous. Right. And if you're chasing this dream for Taz's Angels, it's the dream of hanging out in this like mansion with this guy in the hopes of bumping into someone important who will then make you someone important. Right. Be a video vixen or whatever. In R. Kelly's, it's being attached to this man who um who at one point in time represented something represented something in the way of like um talent and being a visionary and all this Mm -hmm. other stuff and i think you know people 
people were getting really mad that there's a whole segment in on Lifetime praising R. Kelly's accomplishments. And I disagree with not praising his accomplishments because if you don't highlight why he was so important, then you can't possibly wrap your head around why he was able to be so controlling. Right. You know, you can't just paint him out to be this like dude from the street who just like got a bunch of women and started peeing on them. That's not, that's no. not, this is a man who was beloved, who was, you know, who discovered talent, who was a talent, who created this beautiful music and wrote these lyrics in spite of not even being able to read. So you have to develop this narrative of this person and, and focus on how much he actually accomplished to understand how because he was such a demon, he was able to use that gift that most people use for good, for complete and total evil. And you have to focus on, you got to tell that part of the story. Right, I agree with that. You know? It's, I know a lot of people didn't want to come out and say anything because it seems like they're in favor to him. And I see a lot of people now are coming out saying, we were wrong, we were enablers, and we're sorry. Oh, my God. Some people hit me up. Years back, um, R. Kelly held a press junket mm -hmm. um, in Chicago to go listen to an album. Mm -hmm. And I, um, at my one of my jobs, I got some of the editors, like, you know, I was invited. I was like, I'm not going to that. Mm -hmm. And one of the other editors went, and I was like, you're all disgusting. Why are you allowing this man in this? I've always, always, always mm -hmm. been against R. Kelly. Um, yeah, I think I know that about you. What? I think I know that about you. I feel like that's always kind of been your standpoint. And, you know, shout out to Estero, because on her song, We Are in Need of a Musical Revolution, at the end, she talks about R. Kelly. Oh, she know? does? Yeah. Um, she said, as a grown-ass man, we'll videotape a little girl, but we still hear his shit on the radio, you know. Um, and oh, so damn. She, she said it back in, like, 2005. So, but the thing was, I've, like, always been very against R. Kelly, and I remember, I was like, I'm not going to set foot on that on that turf he's disgusting and mm -hmm. one of my um one of my colleagues one of my friends came back and texted me the other day he's like i just want to say i'm sorry you were so right when you got mad at all of us for going to that junket mm -hmm. and you were so passionate about not supporting that man i should have listened to you then because i didn't realize the magnitude of what it was that he was doing but you saw it and you right. knew and he's like you know i apologize because i was really really mad at my colleagues because they showed up they took pictures with him right. they, they supported this like junket and I'm like, this is an abuser. This is disgusting. Don't right. show up. As a member of the media, that's your job to make sure that you don't show up for these things. But right. you not know, just chase the story or chase not the just whatever. Cha if you're going to go there, fly out there and ask well, Isn't him. it Miss Info say something? Yes. When she said that she thought that the coast was clear, basically. I think that's what it was. It was something like where she was like talking about how. I think she said something, too, like that she went and that. I don't know if she wrote something like kind of like in kind of along the lines of what you were saying, like that something was a little off off. Yeah, I, I don't remember exactly what the quotes were now, but and I think like that was a kind of an issue for her as well, that they, she kind of like went back and said something like, oh, or I don't know if she said it wasn't as creepy as she. I don't remember what she said, but I know she said she went because they had a press junket type mm -hmm. thing. She said everyone was invited out to the house that she went and she came back and whatever she wrote was kind of like frowned upon well yeah because i think you know she was one of the few people that would go out there and actually point the bullshit out right you know, she was talking about how people were like oh there's a safe amount of time that's kind of passed right where, but it's like i think the thing that was crazy was you know some people everything seems to be forgivable you know in the eyes of hollywood and, right. and, and the lights and the cameras and all that other stuff but um which it shouldn't be but um I think what we failed to realize is that whole time he was still doing it. Now, do you think the Me Too movement helped this? I do. I think maybe in in a little um, in in some way, I think it did help it. I think, you know, I think because a black woman started Me Too, mm -hmm. I think it was probably very important for her to because she's you Be know she was yeah, she was in the docu series, right? So I think it was really important for her to come out there and you know talk about this because you were dealing with um with like you know young black girls like yeah so i think i think in that regard yeah um that that helped it but i think you know harvey weinstein was the first one of the first in terms of hollywood to get to get this whole like thing you know his his time whatever but in the same way that you know you got to wait for it. R. Kelly was so calculated, man. Like as 
as I don't want to say dumb. That's a really rude word, but like as illiterate and things as he was, like I feel like him and his team was so calculated, and I feel bad for his team because the uh, the things that those people did, like they were all part of it. They've covered yep. things up. They take people like the one girl said they like she got dragged out into an alley when she was trying to rescue her sister, but like what they were talking about, uh, the one guy said he forged the thing for Aaliyah for her to get oh, married. Yeah. yeah. Um, but they were talking about how, like, when he first went to court, mm-hmm. how they kept putting it off and off and off so that when the jury finally saw Sparkle's niece, they're no longer looking at a adolescent. By the time they went to court for it, she was grown. She was grown. It's harder to And the perception of what was really going on was like, what? This is crazy. Well, it know. didn't matter that the girl's coach and her best friend from basketball came out and said, yeah, R. Kelly was at our school. El- like every weekend scamming for girls <laughs> right the, I mean, none of that mattered for whatever reason i don't know if the jury got paid off but they went to he would go to mcdonald's like malls he was looking right and that's the thing he was like preying on girls but then the other thing is backstage at his shows mm-hmm. it was guys looking for these girls in the audience you want to go meet r kelly like y- yeah he's, he's yeah. handlers but i think that's the thing like when you have a team that's so scared of losing that check. Right. And that's what I think a lot of people said was that a lot. They were like, oh, what if we don't get the money? But back to Jonestown, it's, it's, it's focusing on people who they think need it the most and doing these things. Now, I'm not saying I don't think a check should um, dictate your moral compass, but it's kind of gross in the way that he actually picked this team. Right. He picked his prey. You know, it's he's a diabolical genius. And I think it's just like. Just the fact that this has been allowed to persist for so long is also the heart. Because the the worst part about it is you have to equalize him in a way that happens outside of the prison system because there's now no way to prove it because the girls that he's now, he's got to get someone, he's got to get a new teenage prey. Did you see what Dame, not Dame Dash, Damon... I always forget his last name. The one from Shark Tank, the one who did Fub- uh, Fubu. Oh, Damon Albin. Yeah. Fubu. Mm-hmm. Did you see what he put on Twitter? Mm-mm. Uh, he got like some flack for it, but I guess whatever. He said, he was like, don't kill yourself. He's like, you need to own up to what you did. Apologize to these parents. He's like, do your time, then kill yourself. Oh, like to something to that nature. But that's how he said it. And he said, I was watching with my three year old daughter. He's like, and I was horrified. I was in tears. Like, yeah, it was horrible to watch. Like. And I think no Damon Albin. That's not his last name. Oh my God, Damon is it Damon John? That Damon Albin's from a uh, blink. Uh, no, blur. Wait, hold on. <laughs> oh my God, I, I need to correct that. Sorry, because uh, um, wait a sec. I, I have to. That was. I just realized that I was like, uh, okay, journalist. Hold on. Um, Damon John. Damon John. Okay. Kathy. Kathy. Um, <laughs> the guy from Blur. I know it's the guy from Blur who said it. Um, he owns Fubu. Yeah, he owns Fubu. <laughs> No, but um, yeah, but there's he's got to get caught. Right, you got to get caught for that to happen because right now, if if his whole cult is an eighteen year old, I think Chicago and both Atlanta have put out. I don't know if they haven't put out warrants, but they're doing investigations right now. But I don't think anyone right, not to my knowledge, and I guess no one would know. I don't know that anyone there right now is underage, and I don't think anyone right there who's there now is going to say. Yes, he's abusing me. Or I was 13 when it happened. So 10 quick things that you should know about the psychology of cults. Because that's what these all are. And that's Mm kind of what Jonestown was. And that's what this is. Um, They're attractive because they promote an illusion of comfort. And they say that often the cult leaders make promises that they're never going to fulfill and that are unattainable. Um, Cults satisfy the human desire for absolute answers. So that's how... Jonestown got everyone like you can't figure life out I'm gonna figure it out for you come here same thing if you're 14 you want a record deal let's do this um those with low self-esteem are more likely to be persuaded by a cult environment Mm. it's inclusive you're part of something now Mm -hmm. uh new recruits are love bombed quote unquote oh yeah um so basically it's like you're great you're wonderful everything's awesome you're so beautiful Women are more likely than men to join a cult. Hmm. Uh, many cult members have rejected religion. I guess that's more along, along the Jonestown stuff. Mm-hmm. 
Um, Colts maintain their power. Power. I can't talk today. By promoting an us versus them mentality. Mm-hmm. So it's, you know, me and my concubines against whatever. Cult leaders are masters at mind control. Mm. Public humiliation, self-incrimination, brainwashing, paranoia. Mm-hmm. Those are their key uh, uses. Cult members of- often have no idea they're in a cult. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> this is great. What did they say is a cult? Um, what's that gym thing? Oh, CrossFit. CrossFit. <laughs> 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 crossfit uh cult life can have dangerous and lasting effects and i believe that a lot of those women in the docuseries oh absolutely yeah so that's pretty much it i mean do you have anything else that you want to add about this just don't support this man not even to be mad at him and to hate on him don't do anything that's going to put any money in his pocket you know no i know you were saying something like the other day like if you have a cd you want to rock the cd like yeah if privately you, if, in your car if yeah, you listen need to, to hear your dusty cd it's dead currency you already spent the money right you really need that strong desire to listen to that r kelly song right listen to a cd or go find a cassette go find a walkman go do that don't put money in his pocket don't stream don't hate stream don't go on youtube and watch his videos don't do any of that because you're ultimately you're in one way or another it's going into his pocket and it's only feeding this awful awful empire that he's built for nearly two decades and i really hope that he kind of gets it eventually i don't know that he will unfortunately i kind of feel like for a person like him Mm. he would take the route of suicide before he would own up to any of it yeah well if you're gonna do that just make sure you let the girls go first they're not (laughs) they're not send them send them home though yeah home before you do that so um uh so yes that's where we're at with that um trying to think what else uh i didn't ask you in the beginning of the show anything new with you my friend um well i i have a book coming out um yes coming out fall it's uh the history of women in hip-hop and um title tbd now but Uh oh uh, yeah (laughs) damn it (laughs) but no um no, we'll uh it's gonna be awesome. Let's hope. Um but uh yeah, no, that's that's been about it, you know, just hanging around watching docu series and <laughs> <laughs> shit talking on Twitter. Fighting the good fight. Fighting the good fight now, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's uh that's about it. All right. Well, Kathy's last book, uh Commentary Kitchen, is on Audible. Although it's a cookbook. It's a prison cookbook, it's a prison memoir cookbook. It's um rest in peace, prodigy, you know, from Mob Deep. Um the legend the legendary albert prodigy johnson um we did this book in 2016 and you know he basically told the story of his prison experience um as told through the meals that he ate so um you know i don't know if it would be an interesting audible read maybe you can just go get it on amazon but we still do have our free audible trial at audibletrial.com forward slash bread left beyond you can check that out there and where can they find you kath they can find me on twitter and instagram at kath 3000 k-a-t-h three stacks um, and don't use that audible to buy solar coaster. Thank you very much. <laughs> God, I hope he doesn't read it. Um, so if you have anything that you think we should cover, you want to talk about, you can email us at bedlovebeyond at gmail.com. You could text us like our friend did. You could text us again, friend, at 201-862-8BED, 201-862-8233. And you can listen to us on Podbean, iTunes, Pocket Cast, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify. And please rate, review, and like, and subscribe to us on all or on any of the devices that you listen to us to. And April's at Miss April Speaks on Instagram and Twitter. And we're at Bed Love Beyond everywhere else. I think that's it. Yeah. All right. Good times. Peace. Don't drink the Kool Aid. Bye.